Well, hey, today we are talking about Palm Sunday, and I'm really excited about talking about this because to my knowledge, we've actually, though it's Palm Sunday, never actually celebrated this and dug into the biblical story of Palm Sunday ever here at Crossroads. I, I don't think we have, and so I'm very, very excited about this. And like I said at the start of our service, Palm Sunday, it serves as this collection of symbols that all point towards who Jesus is. And those symbols require all of us, everyone who hears this story, whether 2,000 years ago or whether right here in this room today, to answer this question, who is this Jesus? So before we dig into that question, I want to invite you to join me in prayer. God, uh, I thank you. I thank you for Palm Sunday and what it means to us. And so I pray you use my words to be clear so we can understand your words. Speak to us answers for our lives to this question, who is this Jesus? And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, hey, to get our symbols juices full, and we're going to start out with a little game. Who's ready for a game? Who's ready to win a game? Yes, it's time for Uncle Timmy's emojis at the movies game. All right, here's the way the game's going to work. I'm going to throw up emojis in a sequence on the screen in just a bit. And you're going to need to decode, decipher them to figure out what movie we're trying to communicate just through emojis. And so no one's running up here on stage, but I want you to shout out the answer if you know it. And the first person that I hear to shout it out is going to get a little gift. I'm going to get you a bag of Skittles. Taste the rainbow, people. You guys, you guys ready for the emojis game? Who's ready? All right, let's, let's hear the first one. I heard one over here, Lion King, you are correct. Next one. Planes, tra those aren't pillows. Yes, right there, All right next. 27 dresses, somewhere over there. It's a chick flick, never watch it, don't plan to. Next. Yes, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. Next. The final one. I heard one over here, Edward Scissorhands. Oh, I think I threw my shoulder out. That is right. Thank you for playing the emojis game. Give yourself a hand. I need some shoulder surgery after that. Um, that was fun. That was fun, wasn't it? And we would have played that game just because it was fun. But I wanted to play that game to get our symbols juices flowing because here's the point. Although we fail to recognize that symbols are an incredibly important part of our modern lives. We can't live without them. They help us understand complex issues in a very, very simple way and something visual. So here's some modern examples. Check this out. It's a police badge. It's a symbol of protect and serve or this. It's the presidential seal. It's a symbol of ruling authority or this. A cross, it's a symbol of a church or Christianity or Jesus or for people who aren't inside a church, it actually can be a symbol of judgmentalism or narrow-mindedness or this. This for us can be a symbol of ripping your heart out every single year. I think we can win a playoff game this year, I do. Or this right here. This uh, is a symbol in the U.S. of okay. And in France, though, it means zero. In Japan, it means money. But in Brazil, it's an offensive gesture. See, there are so many symbols, and it's important that we pay attention to them because we need to interpret them correctly in order to understand what's trying to be communicated. It makes me think about a story in my life. I've been serving here as the Mason community pastor for the last year and a half, but I've been a pastor at Crossroads for 14 years. So most of the time before that, I uh, actually was serving as our pastor of Reach Out. And so that had me leading uh, Reach Out locally and also globally including all of our go trips to Nicaragua and to India and all the way over to South Africa. And I spent a lot of time in South Africa, so much so that when I was there, I actually had to learn how to drive. It's hard to drive in another country when the wheel's on the other side of the car, the car's on the other side of the road, and GPS is not easily accessible on your phone in a foreign country for less than $10 a minute. So that's just how it worked for me. We had one time where we had a go South Africa trip. We brought 300 people over. And so we had a big core team of volunteers that were going to welcome them. I got there ahead of everyone. 
And then our core team was coming over a little early from the trip as well. So I decided I was going to leave from the hotel in the rental car. And I was going to head out to the airport to pick up this team. And so I head out. And so I, I get on uh, the highway, and I'm thinking, all right, I think I know where I'm going. I'm driving again on the other side of the road, other side of the vehicle with the wheel. And so I, I'm driving on the airport, and I see this symbol. It's this symbol. I say, yeah, this is clearly the airport symbol. So I get off on the exit with this symbol, and I get off, and uh, I, I get to the end of the exit, and I look right, and I look left, and it, it's not pointing me anyway. And I'm saying, that's weird. I can't see where the airport is. And so I, I look for it, and I, I can't find it. And so I decide, all right, I'm just going to get back on the highway, and I'm going to continue uh, with the highway. And so I see that symbol again at the next exit. And so I get off, and I look around, and I'm like, where the heck is the airport? I, I would think I would see the airport. It would be a big thing. So I figure, oh, I must have missed it. So I get off, and I come back around the other way. I go back west. I was going east. I head off. I, I get off the next exit. I can't find it. I do this like five times. I finally, though, find the airport. So I get to the airport, I pick up the team that was coming in advance, and they say, thanks, why are we so late? And we get back on the expressway, and I'm heading out, I say, it's weird, I, I kept on um, getting off at the exit where it would say, Here, here's the airport exit, and it was this symbol, I said, this is the symbol, and they said, that symbol? And I said, yeah, and they said, Tim, that's not an airport symbol, that's a highway exit symbol. Every single exit I got to, I was getting off against the highway. It was just an exit. I was driving in circles for like an hour. And this friend goes, dude, you are such an idiot. And I was like, I know, I know, I, I know. So knowing what a symbol means can be a game changer. It's really important. Jesus understood that symbols are critically important, especially if they're interpreted correctly. And so Palm Sunday is a collection of these symbols. And so here's a bit of the context of 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday. So Jesus, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing people, he's doing all these miracles. And so his disciples are following and all these crowds begin to gather because people want to follow him. His popularity begins to ratchet up and then he uh, decides to perform the sensational miracle. One of his closest friends, Lazarus, he dies. And he's been dead for a few days. And Jesus says, death is not going to have the final word. And so he, rise, he, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And people see this and they say, this is absolutely crazy. His popularity goes to a new level. His notoriety skyrockets. And so everybody is talking about Jesus. He's gone viral. The next thing you need to know is that at the time of Palm Sunday, it's Passover. Passover was the biggest Jewish holiday of the year. And so Jews pilgrims are streaming toward the capital city of Jerusalem to celebrate it. So think about New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Everyone goes there. Or Chicago during St. Patrick's Day, the Green River. Everyone goes there. Think of Florida or Hilton Head spring break. Everyone goes there. They leave us here at home. But it was like that for Jerusalem. And so at Passover, everyone was heading there. And it wasn't just that people were heading there. But you need to also understand that all of the Jews that were coming to Jerusalem during Passover, they had a chip on their shoulder at this time because they were under Roman oppression and they wanted to be freed from that oppression. And so Jesus, knowing all of this, he decides, this is my time to reveal my true identity. This is my moment. This is my time when I'm going to tell the whole world who I am. And so he does. And here's how he does it. It's very strange. He sends his disciples to go get a donkey. A donkey comes, he gets on the donkey, and he starts riding the donkey down this hill. People take palm branches, and they start waving them at him. They start putting them down on the ground. The donkey walks over them. People start shouting, Hosanna. And then as Jesus walks up and he sees the city of Jerusalem, right when he sees the city, he begins to weep. It's a very strange story. It's a very, very odd story. But the story comes into clearer focus if we begin to understand that these unique, intriguing details actually are symbols that are pointing to the identity of who Jesus is. But before I tell you about what these symbols mean, you need to understand there were two prevailing opinions of who Jesus was at this time. You see in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, it says, And when they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? Who is this? Who is this Jesus? That was the question. That was the question for them 2,000 years ago. 
And that's also the question for us here today. Who is this Jesus? And when we look at all these different accounts, these authorized biographies of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, we can see that there were two prevailing answers at the time to the question, who is this Jesus? The first was that he is just a good moral teacher. See, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, and they were treating, them, uh, they were treating him like God. And so we see uh, how the Pharisees respond in Luke chapter 19, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd on Palm Sunday said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, they're saying, uh, Jesus, teacher, rabbi. I mean, people are getting a little carried away here. They're talking to you like you're God and treating you like that. And let's, let's simmer down now. You know, this is a little much. I mean, just rebuke them, please. You're just a teacher. You're just a good moral teacher. You're a rabbi. They did not like the idea of someone else being in power other than them. And this would have broken the stranglehold that they had on power in Israel. And so they said, no, Jesus is just a good moral teacher. That was the first prevailing opinion to the question, who is this Jesus? The second was this, that he is a military liberator. He's a military liberator coming to free the Jewish people from this Roman oppression. In Mark chapter 11, verse 10. We hear people saying this as Jesus came in on Palm Sunday. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. See, David was Israel's most famous king. He was a military juggernaut. He was a fighting machine. He was a beast. And the Bible records, it says one of the kings, Saul. Saul killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. See, under David as king, under his rule, Israel was at their heyday. They were at... They were a global power. But after David, which was 1,000 years before the time of Jesus, Israel began to decline. And so during Jesus' time, uh, they had declined, and Israel was oppressed by Rome. And this had happened, like I said, throughout their entire history, time after time, after time, by nation, after nation, after nation. And so they always seemed to be oppressed, and therefore they they were sick of it. They're fed up. And they said, we want a liberator, a military liberator, a human leader to come and set us free. So it's the same events known as Palm Sunday. It's the same Jesus, one crowd looking on, but two prevailing answers to this question, who is this Jesus? They said he's a good moral teacher or he is a military liberator. That was Israel 2,000 years ago. And I would also say that actually represents America in 2018. No, we don't think that he's a military liberator. But when we ask this question, who is this Jesus, we get a whole lot of answers. Some people say, he's God and he's worthy of my life. Others say, I have no idea who he is. Other people are somewhere in the middle saying, I'm not really sure. I know he's a good teacher. I don't really know. That's absolutely a diversity of opinion across America. And, And what I'm excited about, one of the main reasons being part of this church is that I know we have that diversity of opinion right here in this room. A lot of us think different things, and that's, that's wonderful. That's part of the beauty of Crossroads. Barna Research Group, they did a nationwide study on how Americans answer this question, who is this Jesus? And their president, David Kinneman, had this to say about the study. He said, there isn't much argument about whether Jesus Christ was actually a historical person, meaning it wasn't a fairy tale. People agree with that. But... Nearly everything else in his life generates enormous and sometimes rancorous debate. So when the question was asked, who is this Jesus 2,000 years ago in Israel and right here today in the United States of America, there is no consensus. There is not. So let's ask Jesus how he would answer the question. Who are you? Who is this Jesus? And here is the short answer. Jesus says, I am the king. But I'm not the type of king that you were expecting. He says, I am the Messiah. But I'm not here just to save you from Roman oppression. I'm here to reconnect you to my father. And one of the best ways that we can understand this claim about Jesus is to look at the symbols of Palm Sunday. Specifically, there are three different symbols that point to this identity of Jesus being both Messiah and king, and they're drawn from the Old Testament because Jesus was speaking at the time of Palm Sunday to Jewish listeners. 
And so here's the story again. Jesus, he knows that he's going into Jerusalem, and he, know, he knows that he needs a ride. And so he tells the disciples, go get me a ride. And so <clears throat> they decide that they're going to bring him you know, a ride. And so it's, they just borrow it from someone. It's like the hero in one of those action movies. You know, he just goes and borrows the motorcycle and goes, takes off after the bad guy. It was like that. And, and so what specific sweet ride do the disciples get for Jesus? A donkey. Donkey. A donkey. In the morning, I'm making waffles. A Shrek donkey? The disciples are like, what the heck? But that's one of the key symbols that Jesus uses. See, number one is the symbol of riding a donkey. Jesus instructs his disciples to get this sweet motorcycle known as a donkey. Mark 11, verse 2. Go into the village ahead of you. You'll find a donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it. And bring it here. A donkey makes donkey. So weird. But here's why. 500 years before the time of Jesus, in the Old Testament prophetic book of Zechariah 9 verse 9, it says this. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before the time of Jesus, they say he is going to ride in on a donkey. You need to understand this. While horses, they were symbols of war, donkeys were symbols of peace. So kings would come into town on a horse during wartime, but kings would come into town on a donkey during peacetime. And and this would have been noteworthy to the Jewish audience because they were looking for a military king. They were looking for war. And so when Jesus came in on a donkey, this would have been noteworthy. This would have been a head tilt like, weird. He's coming in on a donkey? See, they did not expect that. Maybe you are not an animal buff and you don't fully understand the difference between a horse and a donkey. But let me help you understand, horse to a donkey, uh, that's basically like a Hummer and a smart car. It's... It's like Air Force One 747 and a twin prop Cessna. I mean, check out the difference between these two things. One says, I'm big and strong. The other says, I'm lowly and humble. One says, I've come for war. The other says, I've come for peace. One says, get ready for a beat down. The other one says, you can beat me down. See, Jesus, by coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, he was telling everyone, I didn't come to be a military liberator. I came as the Prince of Peace. See, it was not an accident that Jesus came in. It was very intentional that he came in on a donkey. It was a symbol. The second symbol that Jesus used was the symbol of palm branches. Some of us may have grown up in church on Palm Sunday. We got those palm branches. Pretty fun, right? Well, this is where it comes from. Matthew 21, verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. What the heck is going on here? People are cutting off branches, like publicly defacing property, and taking palm branches and waving them at him, and then laying them down at his feet for donkey to walk in on? This is odd. This is strange. I want you to sit on that question just for a minute. Anyone here like the Winter Olympics? Winter Olympics was fun to watch, wasn't it? It's very cool. Uh, I enjoyed it. Now, got a little insight on it, though, and might be a little bit of a sexist comment. Stick with me here, though. All right, anytime I ask dudes What's your favorite Winter Olympic sport? I get all kinds of answers. Like, I like hockey. I like snowboarding and the half pipe. I like biathlon. They're cross-country skiing, and then they pull out a gun. I like, I like the luge. Tim, have you ever seen the skeleton? They're going down face first. And new guy's favorite. You guys know what I'm talking about. Curling. Curling. There's like, <laughs> how awesome was that? The U.S. men uh, upsetting everyone, winning the gold medal. They called it the Mira Curl on ice. Yes, it was. And so we dudes, we love all kinds of Winter Olympic sports. But whenever I ask a woman, what's your favorite Winter Olympic sport? I get one 
answer and one answer only. And you know what answer that is? Figure skating. Figure skating. You got to be kidding me. It can't be a sport if you're in a dress and it's choreographed to a concerto of Mozart, maybe Led Zeppelin or something. Just kidding. Actually, it's very, very impressive, very athletic, one of the most athletic things we'll see. But listen, when a woman skates a perfect routine, what happens? Everyone applauds, and then what do they do? They, they throw roses and flowers down on the ice. They throw sometimes stuffed animals down on the ice. It's, it's really, really weird, but that's just what we do in our culture, and it's normal. In biblical times, palm branches were the equivalent of roses and stuffed animals. See, in Time Magazine three years ago, in talking about Palm Sunday, they say this, Jesus' followers covered his path in palm branches on the day he entered Jerusalem after the custom of placing palms in the path of a high-ranking person. The palm branch also signified victory in Greco-Roman times, so the waving palms would have resembled a triumphal procession. And you know, This story, Palm Sunday in the Bible, it's also known as the triumphal entry. So there's this symbol of of waving palms. There's a symbol of riding in on a donkey. There's also another symbol. The third symbol is the symbol of Hosanna. I bet some of us uh, here have never been to church before. Others of us have been in church our whole lives. If you've been in church your whole life, you've probably heard this word, word Hosanna. Regardless of where you are on the church spectrum, I bet you, None of us know what that word means. Hosanna, it's just a really strange word in Matthew 21, verse 9. It says, And the crowds that went before him on Palm Sunday and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. What a strange word. What does that mean? Remember earlier, I told you that there were two prevailing answers to the question, who is this Jesus? He's a good moral teacher or he's a military liberator. There was actually a third. There was a third response, but it was really small. It was a small group of people who had this response. And those people actually were saying, who is this Jesus? Well, he is the king. He's the capital K, king. He's the one that God has promised to us to restore our relationship to him. He is the Messiah. And they were the people who were shouting out, Hosanna! See, Hosanna is a Hebrew word and originally meant save us. But over the centuries it morphed into meaning salvation! Salvation has come! And so this third group of people who were saying Jesus is the king, when they were shouting Hosanna, they were saying this Jesus right here, he is salvation! Jesus, salvation, he has come. He has come on the scene. Jesus hid his identity until now. He would often, throughout the Bible, his ministry, he would heal people, these amazing miracles. And these people afterwards, they'd say, surely you're the son of God. And then afterwards, you know what he'd tell them? He'd say, shh, don't tell anybody. This is our secret. But Palm Sunday is the first public time when Jesus comes out. He says, I am the Messiah King, and everyone who sees that I am the Messiah King, you have to decide if you're going to believe me, that I am the King or not. You're going to need to crown me, or you're going to need to kill me. And we know what they did. We know what they did. They killed him. Five days later, they stuffed a mocking crown on his head, a crown of thorns, and then... They tortured him, and they crucified him. They killed him. Jesus knew how they would choose, too. I believe that's why when he enters Jerusalem on the donkey, and all these people have all this excitement around him, he begins to weep. He knew what was coming. Crown me or kill me. Bow to me or dismiss me. He gave them that choice, and he is giving all of us that same choice. Bow to me or dismiss me. Here's a little bit about my story. Growing up, I grew up in church, uh, enough to get one of those palm branches in Sunday school. Never really understood what the story meant. 
uh, and I thought I was a Christian just because I went to church. I thought, you know, I'm a male, uh, I'm an American, I go to church, I guess that makes me uh, a Christian. And I didn't really understand that the, that the question was, Tim, are you going to bow to me or are you going to dismiss me? See, I always thought there was a third option. I thought it was, well, I'm not going to dismiss you because it seems fairly legit, but bow to you. I mean, that's, that's a little aggressive. I, I don't really want to give you my entire life. I mean, can't I just have all the benefits? Can we be like friends with benefits? Like, you know, I can have all of the good stuff, but I don't have to really bow to you. And, and it wasn't until someone told me, Tim, you can't have this third way. Jesus says, you have to bow to me or you have to dismiss me. And so when I was 16 years old, I, I said, you know what? I, I want to bow to you. I don't want to dismiss you. And, and I understood that that choice had consequences with it. It had ramifications like I couldn't continue to compromise physically with my girlfriend in high school. Like I, was, I couldn't continue just to go to parties and get wasted and think that I was representing Jesus. Absolutely, our, our actions, they do not make us a follower of Christ, but th there's a cost to what we're doing. And for me, uh, th those actions, it took some time after I said, I want to bow to you for those to change in my life. And listen, I am far from making all those changes in my life that I want to. But what I didn't understand was there's not a third way. We bow to him or we dismiss him. And, and when I chose to bow to him, I have to tell you, it's been a continual process of bowing to him really every week and every day of my life since. And, and I, I struggle with it a lot, but I have to tell you, it's the best decision I've ever made. My, my choices are different. My relationships are different. My priorities are different. My dreams are different. I have joy and I have peace like I know I would not have before. And so if you are considering this third way, I want to tell you a couple things. Number one, Crossroads is a safe place. Take the time that you need to explore whether you want to bow to Jesus or whether you want to dismiss him. Take your time. But also be clear. It's the most important decision you will ever make. It's the most important question you'll ever answer. Who is this Jesus? There's no third way. See, what I've seen when I have bowed my life to him and tried to, even though I dismiss him often, I want that for you. I want that for you. And if that's what you want, I want you to know that these symbols from Palm Sunday that point to who Jesus is, you can actually declare, Jesus, I believe that you are the King and the Messiah through another symbol. It's the symbol of baptism. And today we're going to have an opportunity. If you're feeling called right now, if you're feeling led to be baptized, you're going to have an opportunity right here and right now to be baptized. Baptism is like a wedding ring. If you are married, hold up your, your ring. Hold up right now and keep that up. If you're married, ring finger. Now, if, if you're not putting your hand up, if you're single, look around. Uh, anybody who does not have their hands up, they're available. You can thank me later. You can put your hands down. You can thank me later. <laughs> but listen, <clears throat> my wedding ring, it doesn't make me married. It just proclaims, I am married. And the Bible says that baptism is a symbol. It's a spiritual wedding ring. It's an outward expression of an inward faith. It's a public profession of this private faith that we have. Now listen, if I took my wedding ring off, does that make me any less married to my wife Mary? No, I'm still married to her. But I choose to wear my wedding ring because it honors her and it tells everyone else who sees this ring on my finger that I am married. Baptism is like a spiritual wedding ring because it doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a follower of Christ. Absolutely not. Just like the wedding ring doesn't make me married to Mary. But what it does, it shows that you are a follower of Jesus. And so basically getting baptized is saying, I'm not perfect, I never will be perfect, but this one thing I know, I want to go all in for Jesus, and I want to do my best to bow to him, not to dismiss him. Here's a few details about baptism. Uh, we have these tubs, and we dunk people fully under the water, because in the New Testament we read the Greek verb for baptized means to immerse, and so that's why we dunk. You should be baptized, though, for one of three reasons. The first reason is if you're right now saying, for the first time, I want to bow my life 
to Jesus. I may have been dismissing him or a third way. I want to bow to him. That's number one. Number two, maybe you have already received Jesus, but you haven't in your daily life been bowing to him. And so this is an opportunity for you to put a stake in the ground and say, I'm going to leave my mark right here and I'm going to get baptized. Or maybe third, you have received Jesus. You've been doing your best to bow to him, but you have not followed this obedient step that Jesus calls us to. And obsessed, we talked a lot about money and we talked about how uh, God calls us all to, to tithe. It's, it's just a trust thing. A lot of us, we've been following Jesus, <clears throat> but we haven't been baptized as a follower of Christ. And I just got to tell you, it's an obedience thing. It's a trust thing. See, some of us think, oh, gosh, should I get baptized? People are going to think, oh, am I just some spiritual neophyte? Let me give you a little c- couple data points. Brian Tome, our senior pastor, was baptized here at Crossroads because he began to understand the meaning of the obedient call. Chuck Mingo was baptized here. Jesus Christ himself, for crying out loud, was baptized himself. So I want to encourage you to do that. If you come up to get baptized, we're just going to ask you one simple question. Who's your Lord and Savior? And if you can answer, Jesus, I want to bow to him. That's all that matters. You're qualified. If you can't answer Jesus, that's okay. We just encourage you to stay exploring and have the integrity not to come up and get baptized. If you've been baptized as a follower of Jesus, great. It worked. No need to double dip. It worked. <laughs> but maybe you've been baptized as an infant like I was. I was baptized at three years old. My parents did that in the Presbyterian church, and that was great. I received Jesus at 16 years old. It wasn't until I was 23 years old when I first understood what baptism means. That's a call of all followers of Jesus to do it. Once you've made the decision to follow Jesus, I got baptized then too. And so I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but we would love for you to be baptized. We got everything taken care of for you. We've got towels in the back. We've got black t-shirts. We've got bags that you can put all your stuff in. Your family can come up front to support you, your friends. A spiritual mentor can baptize you if they would like. Listen, I know this is one of the biggest decisions that we have ever, ever made. The biggest decision we can make is bowing our lives to Jesus and not dismissing him. And baptism, it's a spiritual wedding ring to show this is how I am all in. And so I want to invite you now with me to pray. And let's just ask God to speak to us right now. God, I thank you for these symbols of Palm Sunday. And they point to the fact that you are the king. And so God, I know we have the opportunity to to right now bow to you or dismiss you. And we want all of us, we want to have the guts to bow to you. If you're calling us to be baptized, just speak to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, this right here, these tubs, this is what all of this is leading toward. This is the whole reason we actually exist as a church, for people who want to say, I'm bowing to you. And so we're going to watch a video right now about someone in our own Mason community who got baptized last evening. His name is Chuck. And during this video, I want to challenge you to be thinking about, is God calling you to be baptized? See, who is this Jesus? He is the king. Will we bow to him or will we dismiss him? What was the clap for over here? It'll sync all the so they line up. Everything. Oh, wow. I thought it was some magical thing. <laughs> <laughs> I started life in a church that uh, taught me that God was a judgmental God, and it was one of those hellfire damnation experiences that we often hear about. But at 28, I discovered that I, I was experiencing a false God. The new God in Jesus that I met is a loving Jesus. And I love that part of Jesus now. I came uh, to Mason, Ohio in uh, 2009 to be near to my son and his three children. And uh, they were going to Crossroads and so that's where I went to Crossroads also. It was at at Crossroads that I began to discover uh, being more aggressive and more outgoing about my learning about Jesus. I had, at one time in my life, I had a very toxic relationship with a person, and uh, I became very angry at them, and I thought that anger served me well. 
and um, I was in a small group at Crossroads. And it was one of the men in that group that said to me one day, I'd like to talk to you after we meet if I could. And he asked me if I would pray for that person. And my response to myself was, I'm not going to pray for my enemy. But I went back to my apartment. I did pray. The anger left me, and I became a different person. The first time I was baptized, I was three months old, and I was baptized in a dress as most children were at that time. And I've been thinking about uh, being baptized as an adult. I think baptism is simply uh, a process of a physical commitment to open up your heart to receive Jesus' love. An old cliche that I've heard years, for many years is, if not now, when? And I decided, when is now. Today is my birthday. Uh, I'm 80 years young. Happy birthday, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. I'll enjoy it. How cool is that? Man. Chuck was the first one in the tub last night, and I don't know if you caught this, but yesterday was literally his 80th birthday. It's just gutsy that he got in this tub. We had to help him out. He was wobbling a bit, but it was, it was beautiful. One of the things I love in the video is he says, if not now, when? If not now, when? I know a lot of us right now, our hearts are kind of beating out of our rib cage. We're like, oh, gosh, am I really going to do this? I mean, I, I didn't plan this. I, I'm not wearing the right clothes. I don't know if this is the right moment, but God, I think you're, you're calling me to do this. I don't know if I should. Yes, I should. Here's what I'm calling you to. If you're right now having your heart beat out of your chest, now's your time. If not now, then when? If not now, then when? And so this is your time. We're going to be ready for you. And so I want to invite all of us to stand up right now because we're going to sing. We're going to get to worship through singing and also through celebrating people's baptisms. And if you are feeling called to be baptized right now, I want you to walk out right now to the back corner right back here Come down the aisles, walk right now to the back corner, and we're going to be there to be with you. We're going to be baptizing all morning, and so let's stand together and let's worship God.